Welcome again. And uh, thank you to the Clark family, which is a third of our church this morning. It's great to have you guys with us. They just rearranged the church back there to fit their, fit their needs. That's awesome. Our theme today, of course, is joy. As Christmas is coming, we're anticipating the celebration of Jesus Christ's birth. He, he comes into the world, and as he does, the angels in Luke chapter 2 says, This day will be a day of good news and will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Lord. It is time for Advent. We celebrate the birth of this child, Christ, and his coming again, coming back. It is both in what he has done and what he will do that we celebrate. Amen? Joy is an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love, his precepts, and his promises. As we journey through the Bible, we come this morning to the story of Hannah. Uh, she has a husband, Elkinah, and a priest, Eli. Eli is both the priest and a judge. He is the second to the last judge. In the time um, period of the judges. Now, last week we studied Ruth, which would have been at the very beginning of Judges, and now as we study Hannah, we're at the very end of the time of Judges. Between the two could be as much as 300 years. Elkinah means God created or God possesses, so he's a godly man. And Hannah means favored one, or in a word, grace. Right? Hannah was favored by her husband, but she was not able to bear children. So Elkanah married an additional woman, hoping to have children by his wife, Penina. Now, her name means jewel, but as the story will show you, she's anything but a jewel. Penina did have children, and Scripture says that she gave Elkanah sons. The rabbinical writings say that she gave him ten sons. And this created a tension in the family, which Elkinah tried to alleviate by showing that Hannah was his favored wife. Scripture says he would give her a double portion, but that didn't alleviate the feeling of loss, humiliation that Hannah felt, mainly because Penina wouldn't let it go. She became her rival by bitterly taunting her and provoking Hannah because she was childless. The uh, GNT translation says, Penina, her rival, would torment and humiliate her because the Lord had kept her childless. Each year they would go up to Shiloh where the tabernacle was and they would give sacrifice to God. This year, Penina had been so cruel to Hannah that she stops eating. And Hannah was so stressed out about the circumstances that she develops the eating disorder. Even though Elkanah had given her a double portion of the sacrifice, showing her that, that she was favored. At seeing how distressed Hannah was, Elkanah tries to console her. He says, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not enough? Am I not more than ten sons to you? I got to tell you, this, this is kind of funny. This is a really man thing to say, isn't it, ladies? He's, he's saying, why are you sad? Aren't, aren't I enough? Can I fill all those voids in your life? Like Elkanah could make up for the loss of children and the torment and the humiliation of Penina. Men, let me give you a clue here if you don't understand this. This is not what your wife wants to hear when she's distressed or sad or upset at the matter. Oh, baby, aren't I enough to make up for the sadness in your life is not where you want to go. What she needs is empathy. What she needs is a good listener, 
Are you listening, young man? Because for you guys that are married, it's probably too late for you. But you guys who aren't married, listen. She needs a good listener. She needs a helpmate. Now, let me go off on a little word study for you here, okay? Helpmate is not a submissive term. In the Old Testament, some want to see Eve as being submissive to Adam because Moses uses the word azer. It looks like ezer, but it's not. It's pronounced azer. It means helper or helpmate. When he says that Eve was Adam's azer, his helpmate, azer simply means one who helps the other one. It's defined by Strong's concordance as an assistant and a support in times of hardship and distress. And there's no sense of authority in the word. And we know this because in Exodus 18 and 4, Moses says, My father's God was my helper, my azer. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. And we know that God is not subservient to Moses, right? God was Moses' helpmate, his azer. Husbands, young men, your wives don't need bosses. They don't need dictators. They don't need rulers in times of hardship and distress. They need an azer beside them, one who comes along the side and provides assistance and support amen ladies okay that's all for free no extra donations needed for that word study in this case Hannah needed Elkinah to get a little bit of a backbone and confront Penina for her cruelty she needs a godly man to come alongside her and pray with her for her circumstances to get better she needed a helpmate. She needed what church? An azer. Hannah then rises up and goes to the court of women where Eli the priest was sitting by the entrance of the temple of the Lord. Now that's what scripture says that it was the temple of the Lord. Just remember this is not really the temple yet. This is the tabernacle. The temple won't come until after King David but they're coming in to where they worship okay and she is praying intently a silent prayer her she's concentrating so much that Karen her lips are moving but there's no words coming out there's no sound coming out and she prays this prayer O Lord of hosts if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant but will give to you give your servant a son then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head now bless her heart and he does Eli sees her mouth moving and no sound coming out and he thinks and he supposes that she's a drunk this poor woman can't catch a break, right? Her sister wife taunts her so much that she develops an eating disorder. Her husband is a little clueless to her needs. Oh, baby, aren't I enough? And then her, her priest, the, the highest religious figure in her life that she should look up to is now scolding her because he thinks she's a drunk. Have you ever been there? Abused? Poorly consoled? Falsely accused? Misunderstood? Don't worry. God's going to bring you joy. By the way, Eli is not a very good priest or judge. He's got a lot of flaws in his life. He, he doesn't reprimand his sons for the awful things they're doing, and he seems to jump to conclusions when he sees poor Hannah praying that she's drunk and she's just given this vow to give her first son to God and when it says that he no razor will ever touch his head he's saying he'll be a Nazarite 
he'll be consecrated to the Lord for the rest of his life. Well, as the narrative goes, Hannah explains what, in her distress, Hannah explains that she was praying. And Eli, as a semi-apology, gives her a blessing asking God to grant her whatever she was praying for. At this announcement, at this blessing of God's high priest, she finds hope. A hope that God will grant a child to redeem her in her family. And a hope of a better tomorrow leads to her living a life of, of joy on that day. Scripture says that the woman went away, ate, and her face was no longer sad. Hannah is now living a life of joy on the expectation of what is coming in her life. They arose that morning, Scripture says, their family worshiped, and then they returned home. It was just a little while, and Hannah conceived and gave birth to a, a little son. And they named him Samuel. God has heard. Hannah kept the baby boy until he was weaned, somewhere around his fifth birthday. And then he was taken into the temple and given to Eli, and they consecrated the boy to the Lord. And each year, Scripture says Hannah would come to the temple and give the little boy a, a new robe, still, still wanting to be his mother, and gave her a little robe. And they said Eli would bless her and Elkanah again. And they repeated this cycle until they had three sons and two daughters. The rest of the story would bear out that Samuel will replace Eli as the last judge and would anoint both Saul and David as king to Israel. But I don't want to leave you there. I want to take you into the prayer of Hannah. So if you, or if you just want to read with me up on the screen, we're going to read the prayer of Hannah. I want you to see the joy in her life. And I want you to see that her joy should be your joy because she's going to tell you about the character of God. By the way, ladies, if you think that only men wrote the Bible, you'd be mistaken. Women compose a lot in the Bible. Miriam, Deborah, Esther, Hannah, the mother of Christ, all compose in the Bible. This is a prayer and a song. This is Hannah's declaration of God's good character, what he's doing now and what he will do in the future. If you would, read along with me. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. By the way, horn just means strength in the Old Testament. When you see horn, just replace it with the word strength. Her strength is lifted, is increased in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken. By the way, bows means warriors. The warriors of the mighty are broken by the feeble, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full now have hired out themselves for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. She's now starting to prophesy. He brings down to Sheol and rises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich, and he brings low and he exalts. He rises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with prince and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of the faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall men prevail. 
The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Now I want you to really pay attention to this next point. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his anointed. This is the first time that the word Messiah is used in relationship to a king. She is professing, she's prophesying that King Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. And it is his strength that she finds her joy. Hannah's joy is knowing that God is sending a king, a king that will right all wrongs, that would be a perfect judge, not one someone who would suppose, but a perfect judge to judge all that is right and that is wrong. It is where she finds her joy in her Lord, in her Messiah, in Emmanuel, God with us. In Matthew chapter 5, there is a story of the parable of the talents. And each of his servants that has exercised his gift from God has a reward. And here is the statement that God makes. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You see, if you're exercising your gifts, your spiritual talents, you're going to enter into the joy of the master. Just a little farther down in Matthew 25, he tells everyone who has fed the hungry in his name, given a drink of water in his name, welcomed a stranger, clothed the naked, visited the imprisoned. In essence, anyone who has practiced tangible love in his name, he says, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Churches, it is in this that knowing that we are going to be in the presence of God forever, for all of eternity, that we have joy in our lives. Because you're going to be abused. And you're going to be misunderstood. And you're, you're going to be put down for things that you're not even guilty of. But there is a God who rights all wrongs who someday you will live in the presence of. If you will just exercise your spiritual gifts, if you will just practice tangible love. And can I say this morning, if, you, if you're here and you haven't confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you haven't put him on in baptism, if you're not living a life of faithfulness to God, what are you waiting on? Because in Christ, we have a joy that can never be taken away, no matter our circumstances. Let's pray, and the sermon will be yours. Dear Heavenly Lord, sometimes life is not very happy, and the circumstances are not very good. Sometimes it pushes in on us, and it presses us down. But Lord, we are not crushed. We're sometimes perplexed at the things around us, but we take joy in who you are, what you have done for us, and what you will do for us when you return again. God, I, I ask for a special blessing on all those who are listening to my voice, that you might bless us with joy in our lives, no matter the circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen.